Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Israel says terrorists involved in the 2611 attacks should be brought to justice. POK echoes reunification with India but Pakistan trained jihadis to counter. And Taliban bans UN female staffers in Afghanistan. In one of the most horrific terrorist attacks in India's history, 166 people were killed and over 300 injured as 10 heavily armed terrorists from Pakistan created mayhem in Mumbai on November 26, 2008. Recently, Israel Knesset Speaker Amir Ohana during his visit to India stated that terrorists involved in the 2611 attacks should be brought to justice. A report. No one could ever forget the fateful night of November 26, 2008, when the port city of Mumbai was rocked by multiple terrorist attacks. Ten lashkar e taiba terrorists from Pakistan carried out 12 coordinated attacks lasting four days across Mumbai. At least 166 people, including 20 security force personnel and 26 foreign nationals, lost their lives and over 300 people were injured. The terrorists targeted multiple places in attacks. These places included CSTS Station, Taj Mahal Palace, Hotel Trident, Kama Hospital, Leopold Cafe and Nariman House. Nine out of ten terrorists were also killed and the tenth terrorist Ajmal Kassab was captured alive and was later convicted and sentenced to death. Recently, Israel Knesset Speaker Amir Ohana, during his visit to India, stated that terrorists involved in the 2611 attacks should be brought to justice. Ohana made remarks during a visit to Nariman House in Mumbai to pay tribute to the victims of the 2611 terror attack. And everyone who took part in this terrible terror attack should be brought to justice. This is a major part of counter-terrorism. So, first we need to prevent, but once we didn't succeed to prevent, everyone needs to be brought to justice. This is our expectation and I think it is the vast majority of the Indian people's expectation. The Speaker of the Israel Knesset visited the room of one of the survivors of the 2611 attack, Moshe Holzberg, who was just two years old when the terrorist attack took place in 2008. Moshe lived with his parents at Mumbai's Nariman House, also called Chabar House. The boy was rescued by his nanny, Sandra Samuels, who was hiding in a room when the 2611 attacks unfolded. We just visited Moshe's room, who was two years old when this event took place and we saw the wall that uh, represents his height when he was 11 months old and then later on when he was what 11 11 years of age and someone wrote there three words that someone was and still is the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. And those three words are Am Israel Chai. The people of Israel lives. The seeds of Pakistan tryst with terror actually was sown after Pakistan's debacle in 1971 war. Pakistan got divided. East Pakistan became Bangladesh. Since then, Pakistani leadership led by Zulfakar Ali Bhutto, had pledged to bleed India with thousand cuts. With the government's knowledge and the military's support, terrorists continue to operate and raise funds inside Pakistani territory. There are several kinds of terror groups operating in and from Pakistan that can be distinguished by their sectarian background and their areas of operation. Their objectives may vary from overthrowing the Pakistani government or orchestrating attacks on Indian soil. However, the seeds of terrorism sowed by Pakistan 
to target neighboring countries have returned to haunt it. Terrorist groups have grown so powerful that they are nominating their own shadow government openly, challenging the state. Taliban rule has had a devastating impact on Afghan women. The Taliban have imposed rights violating policies that have created huge barriers to women's and girls' health and education. In the latest diktat against women in Afghanistan, the Taliban has issued an order to ban Afghan women employees of the United Nations from working throughout the country. A report. Since the Taliban group stormed back to power in Afghanistan in August 2021, the group has been clamping down on women's rights by barring them access to education and public spaces. In the latest diktat against women in Afghanistan, the Taliban has issued an order to ban Afghan women employees of the United Nations from working throughout the country. The United Nations General Antonio Guterres has criticized the Taliban's move and called it an intolerable violation of the most basic human rights and asked the Taliban group to immediately revoke the decision. According to reports, the enforcement of the ban had prompted the United Nations to ask all employees to not report to their offices until further notice for security concerns. This banning of women to work for UN agencies is a blatantly illegal order. They are telling the world body who they should employ, who should they should not employ. Okay, now, and especially this particular banning is being done on the grounds of sex. Women cannot... Uh, work for the UN. Now the UN, I think in solidarity has suspended its operations in uh, Afghanistan. But the fact remains that for humanitarian reasons the UN will have to work in Afghanistan and after some time they will have to call their male employees back. So this is something that is being done. I admire the sentiment but we know the UN will be back in business because they want to do good for the people of Afghanistan who are actually starving. So all this leads to only one thing, the gradual but to comprehensive and total exclusion of Afghan women from education, from employment, from government jobs, all forms of empowerment. The United Nations mission in Afghanistan earlier expressed concern that female employees in the eastern province of Nangahar had been stopped from reporting to work. Taliban restrictions in Afghanistan, especially the bans on education and NGO work, have drawn fierce international condemnation. But the Taliban have shown no signs of backing down. Earlier, women have been banned from universities and working at national and international non-governmental organizations. The Taliban had promised to respect women's rights when they swept back to power in August 2021. But ever since their return, there has been steady streams of setbacks. In March of last year, the Taliban broke their promise to reopen secondary schools for girls. Two months later, women were forced to veil their faces as well as their hair. In September, Women's Affairs Ministry was disbanded. Thereafter, in December, the all-male interim government ordered all foreign and domestic non-governmental groups in Afghanistan to suspend employing women as some female employees didn't wear the headscarf correctly. This slow taking away of rights from women, asking them to wear the burqa, uh, depriving them of education, government jobs, this has been a step-by-step -step affair. Initially, they were told not to come to the universities so that steps could be taken to ensure that they would be protected after they came back. We know that once they were barred, from the universities and later from the schools, no steps were taken because there were no steps to be taken. They were actually safe within the schools and the universities. This was a step to ensure that they would leave the colleges and universities without any protest. And they succeeded. Once they were excluded, they were now told that you could not come back and you can't do much about it now. The same step has been applied to uh, uh, women employees in the government. This step by step in exclusion of Afghan women from society is part of Taliban's agenda. 
The Taliban regime has failed to earn recognition from any UN member state because of their rigid and intransigent mode of governance. Their inability to transform their mindset on issues such as women freedom. Taliban government should understand that the country can't survive in the 21st century by pursuing a retrogressive and ultra-conservative approach. The eventual outcome of suppressing the freedom and creativity of women will be the erosion of the Afghan society. Banning women's movements, curtailing all their freedom, health and education will augment frustration and anger among the Afghan women. A recent analysis by the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost, costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finished secondary school and entered the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least 5.4 billion US dollars. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. The voices of reunification with India in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir are echoing across the region. Pakistan, on the other hand, in bead with the development and growth of the Indian Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, has resorted to train jihadis against India in the illegally occupied territories of POK and Gilgit Baltistan. We have a report. After enduring over 75 years of Pakistan's misrule, residents of POK are now clamoring for reunification of erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir. The voices of reunification with India have emboldened in the region ever since India abrogated Article 370, proclaiming Jammu and Kashmir as its sovereign union territory. The people of Pakistani occupied Jammu Kashmir are looking towards India. Activities are being conducted in that vein how to join Mother India. This is what is taking place in POJK. Now, in order to counter this, the Pakistani military establishment has once again resorted to its old tactics of using its proxies against progressives, against nationalists, against democrats, and above all, against the forces in POJK who call for the reunification of Pakistani occupied Jammu Kashmir and occupied Gilgit Baltistan with Mother India. Envied with the rapid growth and development in India's Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan has resorted to planning jihad against India. According to information shared by the POK activist Amjad Ayub Mirza, a militant student's wing, jamiyat e tuliba has given an open call to the youth in Ravla court to join jihad. Recently in Ravla court, the Islamic jamiyat e tuliba held a big conference in which they invited the local Kashmiri youth from colleges and universities to join jihad against India. And these jihadis, Islami Jamiyat Tulba, Jamaat Islami, and other terrorist groups are openly asking for donations, collecting donations, collecting money, and announcing them to encourage others to pay. Millions of rupees have been raised in the past couple of weeks in the name of jihad e kashmir allegedly funded and directed by the pakistan inter services intelligence agency jamiyat e tuliba is a shot in the arm for pakistan to subvert any local dissent in the illegally occupied territories last month during the celebrations of hindu festival holi the islami jamiyat e tuliba militant group attacked the Hindu minority students in several educational institutions in Pakistan and illegally occupied Kashmir. Their objective was certain to indoctrinate the Islamic youth into jihad and instill fear among the other religious minorities. 
the people of POJK are asking for reunification of POJK with Mother India and then like a knife, like a missile, Pakistan army throws its proxies into every single university and college to make sure that they not only are present there as a threat to the forces that want to join India, but also to make sure that the jihad in Kashmir is a living reality. But the jihad in Kashmir is collapsed, is failed. It it was it's doomed. Anti-Pakistan protests are erupting all across the illegally occupied territories. Although Pakistan does carry out radicalization exercises to indoctrinate youth into jihad against India, there seem to be no takers of Pakistan's diabolic and fanatic agendas. Pakistan-sponsored terrorism is not yet over in the Indian Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir, but is declining fast. The Director General of Police in Jammu and Kashmir noted the same during a press meeting in Bandipura district. We have a report. The Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir has seen a sharp decline in terrorism in the recent years. Although the Pakistan-sponsored terrorism has not come to an end yet. In a recent incident of cross-border terrorism, Bandipura police along with CRPF arrested a terrorist associated with the Lashkar-e-Taiba terror outfit during a Naka checking and recovered arms and ammunition. A few terrorism incidents do surface in the valley, but the alert police and armed forces have been able to foil those attacks in an effective manner. Speaking to reporters in Bandipura, the Director General of Police, Dilbagh Singh, assured that terrorism in the valley is declining fast and it has declined to an all-time low. He also mentioned that the youth who were pushed to terrorism have returned to the mainstream. Today, Kashmir Valley is by and large free of all the known militants who are there. Now what are left is the remnants of these militant ranks and these Pakistan is trying now to combine them and make them into an organization called TRF. Just to show that militancy is alive over there and giving orders to these people that look, what you do is you do random targeted killings so that a message goes across that militancy is still active. The militants are active in Kashmir Valley and normalcy is not there. This also is acknowledged by the security forces and the uh, Director General Police that total militancy is not yet eliminated from Kashmir Valley. It will take some time, no doubt, but we are sure that the way things are going on, the way operations are going on in conjunction with the raids conducted by NIA, the money trail that is being observed and uh, being investigated by NIA, militancy in Kashmir Valley will soon be finished and most probably by the time next January comes, we will have Kashmir Valley free of all these terrorists over there. The security forces in the Union territory of Jammu and Kashmir are putting in all efforts to put an end to terrorism in the valley. Apart from terrorism, the security forces have launched a special drive against the drug menace in every range and district of the Union territory. So now Pakistan is using drones to send in the drugs. We have found that the area between Jammu and Punch is being used by Pakistan to send in these drones and the drones have drugs, arms, ammunition and also it has literature which is there for the they are uh, overground underground workers to show it around and push the drugs around. The idea is that the these underground overground workers would sell the drugs, get the money from that and also the youth of Kashmir Valley will get addicted to it and the, prob the problems of drug addiction would become so massive that soon we would find that most of the youth over there are useless to do any work. Now the government has taken very strong steps against it. We have seen there have been drug seizures recently also and in the past also.
The nexus between drug traffickers and terrorists is a potent threat to the security at Indian borders. Islamabad has been heavily relying on the sale of drugs in Kashmir to fund its terror infrastructure. Hence, it becomes an imperative for India to formulate strategies to bust terror modules along with effective crackdown on drug trafficking networks. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.